What's up everybody? Ryan and Greg here to talk about the finale of Jordan Peele's revival of The Twilight Zone. This is episode 10, Blurry Man. Now, major, major spoiler warning. If you haven't seen this episode yet, get out of here, go watch it, then come on back. You don't want to be spoiled by the first scene. This episode was written by Alex Rubens and directed by Simon Kinberg. It follows tortured writer Adam Wegman, played by Seth Rogen, who learns the hard way that there's more to art than just entertainment. You know what? I think we can beat this. Okay, let's try that again. This episode actually follows Sophie Gelson, portrayed by Zazie Beetz, a writer for the new Jordan Peele Twilight Zone who tries to find the balance between campfire stories and providing a deeper message about human nature and society. And things take a sharp turn when Sophie is haunted by a mysterious blurry man as she's forced to face her fears head on. She is about to learn that when blurry comes to focus, there can be no escape from the fate laid out for her in the Twilight Zone. <laughs> Before we get into some Easter eggs and references, of which there were quite a few in the finale. Just a few. <laughs> let's talk about our overall thoughts for the episode. Okay, so this episode took such a weird detour from the rest of the season that I actually found it bizarrely enthralling. I'm not gonna lie. The narration fake out to a meta Kaufman-esque setting was so damn jarring and surprising that I actually really enjoyed it. You know, blurring the lines between fantasy and reality, the Twilight Zone, they're actually doing it. I love it. Now, if you watched every episode this season, regardless of how you felt about every episode, you probably, just like us, hate it, love it, hate it, love it, whatever it was, this had to feel a bit rewarding for you. At least for me, it was. I mean, especially because there's a lot of tonal shifts in the episode, and they do a lot of things stylistically differently, so it, it seems like it's almost got a little bit for everybody on it. There are some things in this episode that I loved, and some things that I just thought were, meh, okay. Like the first half with the opening was awesome. Second half with the Monster of the Week didn't work as much as I wanted it to. Now I completely understand where they're going with this. Art versus entertainment. You got your Monster of the Week. You want it, huh? Here it is. Here it is. And they throw in every metaphor you can think of. I loved it. I just didn't like the setup of actually watching Zazie, you know, fall down, trip, do the whole trope. I think it was competently done. It just wasn't necessarily- Nothing special about as that. As much as interesting to me as some of the other yes. elements of the episode. But I do think it's still okay in that it all speaks to the theme of the episode. Like, it's still true to itself, mm -hmm. even if you're not, like, wild about the moment. Yeah, a writer for The Twilight Zone is battling her inner monologue while being haunted by the legacy of the show. So while the Monster of the Week stuff didn't really work for me, the second it goes back into crazy town, when everything goes black and white, I'm on board, including the unsettling, uncanny valley, Rod Serling image that I will, that will just haunt my dreams for years to come. I never want to see that again, but it's weird as hell. I, I applaud them for actually doing it because uh, I don't think we're ever going to see that again or that ghost of Serling. So, uh, let's, probably not. It's just so damn weird when the episode ended, all I could think was, yeah, I like that. I mean, this episode was straight up my alley. My favorite kind of storytelling is this Ken Finkelman-esque fourth wall breaking stuff. Mm -hmm. I love these types of stories because they can be willfully referential and self-reflexive and allow themselves to indulge in a kind of disarming and pleasantly arrogant introspection before they peel away all of the layers of facade by the conclusion. I love Peel doing the pompous, aloof showrunner and narrator who nods his way through conversations with his lead creative. The banter with Rogan just breathes life into a show whose style heretofore has been less than openly comical. This episode does not do everything perfectly or entirely gracefully, but I loved the attempt and found it to be the surprising and satisfying conclusion to a series by which I was already well enamored. I agree that it sagged a bit when it shifted into its Monster of the Week mode, however I have to say that I adored the conclusion. Its sentimental and heartfelt portrayal of a Twilight Zone era Rod Serling is haunting, and it rolls perfectly into a series that has established its voice with progressive storytelling. Also, telling its own story of struggling with the lines between entertainment and art is pitch perfect. Lastly, I have to gloat and shake my finger at Mr. Jordan Peele. Okay. First, the gloating. Okay. <laughs> I was right about the guy in the background in all the different episodes being connected. Oh, God. And now I have to shake my finger. I have to shake my finger at you, Mr. Peel, for not making this 10th episode and finale about Whipple. He's not watching this, and he's not going to watch it. I know. Don't. Don't sweat it. Honestly. Like, if you're worried about anything, you should be worried about the fact that you are apparently in an episode of The Twilight Zone right now. Okay, now some of our favorite moments from this episode. Mm -hmm. 
I think the Jordan Peele's producer character is fantastic. Oh, he, like his his Jordan Peele, <laughs> Jordan Peele's Jordan Peele is perfect. It reminds me of one of my favorite TV series, uh, Ken Finkelman's Newsroom from Canada, which is also followed by More Tears. If you've never seen those shows, they're amazing. Mm -hmm. And uh, similar to this one, they have a story where the characters are part of news crews and stuff, but then they kind of become separated from reality and it goes, it's just like this. It's very basically. extremely mad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Life is theater, and theater of the absurd is a meltdown 20 miles from the biggest population in the country. And what do you do? You turn it into real theater. Yes? One of my favorite parts of that was the two times he takes popcorn and just starts kind yeah. of like idly eating it while <laughs> not really listening. Or, or yeah, his uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, uh -huh. while he's yeah. getting his hair brushed and just like, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. He made art with it for grown-ups, and the reason he's in every episode... Well, he's until now, right? Until now. I absolutely love the sets. I love Sophie running through each set from a different episode of The Twilight Zone, or you would see a set in the background. I thought that was pretty well done. Yeah, it's this horrific backlot tour. Sophie walks through the Not All Men office set and the Outdoor Mayhem set. You also have the bar from The Wonderkin, including the jukebox that we saw at the opening of the episode. And in the club, you can see stacks of The Wonderkin books. Did you really ran Steven's campaign? I did. I ran it right into the ground. <laughs> We're gonna have to go through all of the Blurry Man sightings from all the episodes. Yes. Now I just wanna say I feel pretty good about the two that I caught. Good job. Earlier in the season. Good job. <laughs> we talked about it in our breakdown of Point of Origin, but let's hit all of them now. First off, in The Comedian, the Blurry Man appears behind Samir outside Eddie's Comedy Club. In Nightmare at 30,000 Feet, you can spot him at the newsstand behind Justin. In Replay, we can see him standing still and holding up a cigarette doing his best Rod Serling pose. In Episode 4, you can find him hanging out in the background of the holiday party crowd as a traveler, played by Steven Yoon, is jamming out to Christmas karaoke tunes. In The Wonderkin, he's spotted among campaign workers who are organizing posters for Oliver Foley. In Six Degrees of Freedom, the figure can be spotted just out of focus in the graduation picture during a scene on board the Bradbury spacecraft. Now you can barely see him, but if you look hard, you can spot him in the crowd of men roaming the streets in Not All Men. He's also spotted on the move in Point of Origin as he goes past Eve at the grocery store. And finally, you can spot him in the ninth episode as Jeff walks through the halls of his university. Next up, the opening of this episode should remind you of the Richard Matheson penned classic episode, A World of Difference, where a businessman, Arthur Curtis, sitting in his office inexplicably finds that he is on a production set and in a world where he is a movie star. Cut. Now, Sophie runs through a bunch of different sets from the Twilight Zone, including a grocery store named Smith's Groceries from Point of Origin. Smith's Groceries, of course, originally appears in the classic episode of the Twilight Zone starring Burgess Meredith, Time Enough at Last. Now, there is a quick blink and you'll probably miss it cameo from everyone's favorite 90210 character, or second favorite 90210 character for some of you out there, Jason Priestley. I missed. I didn't realize that was him. I, I, so I, didn't, I saw his name in the closing titles and I had to go back. It's so good. <laughs> The Adam Wegman story of an author's words coming to life mirrors a bunch of classic sci-fi, including, ironically, the 1960 Twilight Zone season one finale, A World of His Own. A giant red-eyed elephant is standing in my hallway and will not let her pass. Oh, Gregory, don't be ridiculous. There were several references in this episode to Time Enough at Last from the classic series, which is one of my personal favorites. It's probably one of the first episodes that I really fell for in the original series. Mm -hmm. And also it's basically Sophie's favorite, you might infer. Hey, come on, let her watch the show. It's just make-believe stories. She needs to get it in the real world with real people. Where are you? She could do both, right, Sophie? 
And of course, towards the end, after the show turns black and white, she goes up the steps to the library and she mm -hmm. passes Meredith's glasses yes. that yeah. are sitting on the steps. And the steps themselves are all, what are they, book titles. You've got the Iliad in there. So it's just a very, very nice tribute to the original episode. That's not fair. That's not fair at all. There was time now. There was was all the time I needed. Okay, everybody, that's it for us over here. We'll be back here for one more, one more video to wrap this all up for season one. Now, before we do that, let us know what your favorite episodes were in the comment section down below. Top five. Five? Mm -hmm. I think five's good. Yeah, just a, that's a good number, five. Just give us the five. And let us know what you thought about the entire series in general. Yeah, and we'll be back here as soon as we can. Bye-bye. <laughs>